if anyone wants to tune in later. Okay, so kind of the documentary foundation section. As we've been doing, I am going to pull up a little short video that actually is with Archbishop Duncan. It's quite well done on this whole section. And then we'll kind of look at it. It's rather unique in this prayer book in comparison um, to those that precede it. So let me see if I can get this going here. All right, let's see if this will play. Here we go. I am Phil Ashey from the American Anglican Council. We're here finishing up this introduction and orientation to the 2019 Book of Common Prayer. Last section, Documentary Foundations. Now, this is why we're here today. Uh, why we are an Anglican church in North America. Uh, why we subscribe to these uh, these confessions of faith. And so let me just say a few things about them. The fundamental declarations of the province beginning on page 766. These describe what we as members of the Anglican Church in North America believe. Um, now, if you don't want to believe these things, you don't need to be a member of the ACNA. But if you're a member of the Anglican Church in North America, this is what we all agree to believe on. Because it's reflective of that faith once delivered to the saints and for such a time as this. Now, the College of Bishops resolution concerning the Nicene Creed uh, talks a, a little bit about the um, controversy over the Filioque Clause. I commend it to that to you. And then there's the Athanasian Creed, which is an ancient Catholic creed that rarely gets much attention, but is one of the three Catholic creeds that shape our belief as Christians today. There's the 39 Articles of Religion. And you'll know from following us on YouTube that the American Anglican Council has done an exhaustive little two minute uh, segment series, 100 videos on the 39 Articles because we believe they are as relevant to us today in how we believe and what we believe and how we share our faith as they were when Cranmer and others formed them at the birth of the Church of England. And then finally, we have the Great Jerusalem Declaration 2008 that is the heart of the great global Anglican Reformation that we are a part of through GAFCON. And this too is a great confession. It is, of course, uh, time bound by the circumstances uh, that we were facing in 2008 and continue to face and yet it reiterates everything that we've just talked about in terms of the Catholic creeds, the ecumenical councils, uh, in terms of our uh, adherence as Anglicans in our Anglican tradition to the 39 articles uh, and in moving forward to the authority and the clarity of the Holy Scriptures as our ultimate and final authority. These are not just historical artifacts. I want to say that. These are statements of what we believe as Anglicans and what we hold dear. They are the basis and the foundation for this great 2019 Book of Common Prayer. So please don't leave them to the very end to read. Take a good look at them now and let it shape your thinking as we move forward together in mission as Anglicans in North America and all over the world. The very last section of the prayer book is called Foundational Documents. And they're actually, they're, they're documents on which we're founded. Um, the very first document in the section uh, is called Fundamental Declarations of the Province. Uh, it says the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testament, you know, are the word of God and nothing can be taught apart from them. It says those kinds of things. Uh, the next piece that's there is uh, the House of Bishops, the College of Bishops teaching on the Nicene Creed, that we're going to translate the creed into English 
um, a as close as we can possibly get to what the original Greek says. The third uh, document that, that's there um, is the Athanasian Creed, which is the third of the Western creeds, originally in Latin. It really describes the relationships within the Trinity. Um, and again, it's one of the creeds in the West that's always been held along with the Apostles and the Nicene to be uh, central. It's one we don't use in worship, but it's very important. In, in our life and our understanding of who God is and how his persons uh, co-inhere. Uh, the fourth is the, um, uh, the 39 articles. Uh, again, these are articles, um, these are declarations about particular theological subjects at the Reformation. And they make very plain where the Church of England and then Anglican churches stand in relationship to the whole Christian faith. Um, uh, crucial documents at, at the Reformation. The fifth of the pieces is something called the Jerusalem Declaration, and his, uh, it has a date of 2008, a really modern document. But again, uh, it, it's a, a declaration of Orthodox Anglicans meeting in Jerusalem on a very significant global conference. Uh, in 2008, saying, here's what Orthodox Anglicans believe, with reference to all the things I've just mentioned. Then there are two more foundational documents. One is the preface to the 1549 prayer book, which explains why the prayer book appeared at the English Reformation. Uh, the, the final piece is the preface to the 1662 prayer book, which explains the historical context uh, in which that prayer book, which becomes the, the essentially the, the sine qua non, the, the fundamental uh, the prayer book of the whole Anglican world. So those are the, the foundational documents. All right, so we'll take a look at them. Um, prior prayer books, as they kind of alluded to, often in the back of the prayer books was kind of a no man's land of documents. Um, they usually didn't have a lot of explanation. They usually didn't have a lot of um, context. They just called them historical documents and they just kind of threw them all in there. Um, what I've loved about this prayer book is that there's some intentionality behind the way they put these together. They're not just kind of everything but the kitchen sink, um, but they, they have a methodology behind it. Um, and I, I absolutely love it because it's robust. Um, we actually have foundational declarations of the province um, that you can find on the uh, ACNA website. It's on page, um, in the Book of Common Prayer on page 766. What I thought we'd do is kind of look at these. There's only seven of them. Um, and then we'll look at the rest of uh, the documents and just talk about them briefly. Um, these fundamental declarations uh, really pull from all sorts of different documents. Um, some of them pull from the 39 articles, others pull from that Jerusalem declaration that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and some of them just pull from historic belief and practice within Anglicanism as a whole. One thing, um, just to clarify terms that will be helpful as we go forward <clears throat> is um, Anglicanism has never been uh, confessional uh, in the sense that uh, some uh, Christian tra traditions are. We don't have an Augsburg confession. We don't have something like that. Um, the 39 articles are the closest we get, but we're not confessional in the sense that one must um, tick off a certain set of boxes and say this is what Anglicanism is, um, because Anglicanism really, um, at its best, is kind of always posited to be almost like a, a glass that just holds historic Christianity from age to age. So it doesn't claim anything uniquely as its own, but rather holds, uh, hopefully faithfully, um, to the historic faith, uh, the Christian faith, as it's been passed down through the ages. Um, so Anglicanism has, is often called conciliar. Um, conciliar basically means that what we uh, form or ascribe to comes through meeting together, through councils, through um, discussion, through conversation. 
Um, and so in many ways, um, it, it follows in the great tradition of the church, which often would meet together, uh, spend time in prayer and worship, and then have some very frank conversations about uh, the issues that face uh, the Christian church at any day and age. Um, we'll look at some of those. Uh, historically, there were only seven ecumenical councils whereby the whole of Christianity, as we know it, uh, met together to hammer out um, those basic things. But Anglicanism has really kind of continued on in that, and as we'll look at it in a moment, um, that's where the Jerusalem Declaration uh, was birthed. That's what really GAFCON is all about. GAFCON um, being the Global Anglican Future Conference began in 2008 in Jerusalem, which, which produced that Jerusalem Declaration um, and has met every, uh, I think it's every three years um, since. And it's those who are um, biblically faithful uh, Orthodox Anglicans from all around the globe that want to meet to engage the issues that face the cultures across the globe, whether it's um, on issues of, uh, you know, um, uh, ancient pagan religions that certain global Anglicans are facing, um, to secularism, um, to human sexuality, and everything in between. And so meeting together, praying together, talking about what different cultures are facing, standing together, uh, looking back at scripture, looking back at the creeds and, and these, uh, um, um, uh, drawn a blank at our other, uh, meetings together in the council. Sorry. Um, all of that informs going forward kind of to remember the, the preacher in Ecclesiastes, um, really nothing is ever new under the sun. Things just kind of, you know, take a lap around and pop up in a different way. Um, things like technology, different cultures and ages uh, may change those things, but ultimately the underlying issues and the, and the rebellion in the human heart is really always the same from one age to the next. Um, and just about any kind of deviation to the Christian faith that one could imagine has, has more or less been imagined or uh, dealt with in some prior age. So um, kind of round and round we go in that way. But I, I just tee that up as a little bit of um, preface to kind of what we'll look at um, and mm -hmm. pause and see if you have questions on any of that. Um, what province are we talking about? Um, so we're a part of the Anglican Church in North America, which is kind of our province. Um, GAFCON okay. is not a province, but rather a uh, coming together of provinces from all over the world. So uh, okay. the Anglican Church in North America is a province that is a part of GAFCON. So the, the whole of the Church of Nigeria, of Kenya, um, of, of parts of Southeast Asia, um, South America, all of those constitute what is known as GAFCON. Um, we used to have uh, instruments of communion, and when those began to break down, um, a lot of the uh, global leaders from different provinces and continents uh, of Anglicanism around the world said, we, we've got to find a way whereby um, we can agree to the fundamentals of the faith and yet also tackle the issues that we are faced with in our age. And so GAFCON was kind of birthed. There was just an invitation that went out to all those um, who were like-minded and it produced this declaration, which kind of had become uh, a bit of a standard by which we can say um, th the downside to not being confessional as a, as a tradition is that there's not something you can put in front of every Anglican province and say, are you in or are you out? Um, at its best, Anglicanism has said, well, if we're going to look at the historic faith, we look at all of what the historic faith has brought us and the councils and the whole of scripture. And, and those things um, are, are certainly still informative today, but they're not necessarily open for uh, ongoing revelation in, in their literal sense. And so um, when that began to be challenged, um, GAFCON was a way to say, well, let's get back together, get back around those things, hammer those things out and hold ourselves to such an account so that we can do life together in some sort of meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So that's um, what that produced. Um, but good question. So there's lots of little alphabet soup things that kind of get thrown in. 
um, along those lines. Um, but uh, GAFCON really is more just kind of a confederation, if you will, of lots of different provinces from around the world, okay. not, a, not kind of like a super province or anything of that nature. But um, those who are of like mind and belief that get together um, periodically really to do life together. Um, and, and really GAFCON kind of bears witness to the stamp of Anglicanism and being conciliar, um, recognizing that if we're going to be together, um, we don't have a Pope or somebody that is a mouthpiece for Anglicans globally, but rather, you know, the highest level of authority in Anglicanism is the local bishop. And so the local bishop should hold one another accountable within a province or a region. They might have a archbishop, but the archbishop is more functional than, than he is, you know, authoritative. He's a brother <laughs> bishop to all of his other bishops, and they're holding one another in account. And then worldwide, the same is true. Um, and so uh, as that plays out, there's a need always relationally to meet together, uh, to get to know one another, um, to know what issues face each part of the globe as to how we can support, not just financially, but prayerfully, um, theologically, one another and the challenge that we're faced in our own context. So, um, so it's kind of a unique structuring. Orthodoxy is much the same. Uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, Rome, of course, is much more ecclesiastical and has a very strict hierarchy, um, but Anglicanism has had more of kind of a, a mush down effect. It's not just a, you know, kind of a, a sequencing, but rather kind of a collegial structure um, mm -hmm. that is on the highest level with the bishops. So it has its, like any structure, has its pros and its cons. Um, and so really this prayer book <clears throat> kind of tips its hat to that structure and the things that have been done um, to really keep us walking together, not just in name only, but, but truly uh, in life and community. So these um, foundational declarations pull from a number of places. Um, this first one is, is straight off of the 39 articles. It's right at the beginning, um, namely that we contain the whole of scripture, Old and New Testaments, to be the inspired word of God, you know, thinking to your uh, Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3, 16, um, containing all things necessary for salvation, the final authority um, on the Christian faith. So kind of right out front, um, that's where they've placed that. Um, you're going to find some variation, again, with an Anglicanism on some of these things. These are things that everyone can agree to without any hiccup, um, but then some will add, you know, qualifiers to it. So the second, second one is, is an example of that. Um, nobody um, in Anglicanism would say that baptism and the Lord's Supper um, are anything but sacraments ordained by Christ um, and to be ministered uh, with his unfailing words of institution and the elements ordained by him. Those are just kind of normative things. Um, now that doesn't uh, exclude the other five sacraments, um, but um, you'll get into some interesting conversations with some within Anglicanism. Um, those two are considered dominical in that Jesus spoke them directly. And for some Anglicans, that's all they see as, uh, as necessary. Um, but most of the rest of Anglicans, including um, many within uh, our tradition here locally um, and as housed in the prayer book would say, well, you know, reconciliation is still sacramental as is marriage, as is holy orders. Um, so there's, there's a little variance on some of these things therein, but they kind of put down the things that there was no quibble about within the foundational documents section, if that makes sense. Um, now having been reared in the Episcopal Church, could you briefly explain what the Episcopate is? Yes. So it's a great, great question. Um, so Episcopate um, is really just a kind of crude English translation of the Greek word episkopoi, which means overseer, which you often see Paul use in his letters to Timothy about being mm -hmm. an overseer or a shepherd of the faith. Um, so Episcopate basically is just uh, a word that, that uh, denotes that structure or that order. Um, so Anglicans really have always held uh, to um, 
the fundamental belief of the Episcopate um, because not only in just the laying on of hands physically from one generation to the next and the promulgation of the faith through bishops, um, but that basically that faithful teaching is passed down from one generation to the next. And really it's the office of the Episcopate, the office of the bishop, um, who is charged with safeguarding the faith and maintaining the faith in his age. Um, so in my office, if you ever are interested, when we are finally kind of back into normal life together, um, on my wall is a, uh, a kind of a family tree, which, which shows from Jesus to the 12 and down through the branches in Whale and Canterbury, uh, all down through, it's dated down to Bishop Iker, but we could pencil in or ink in Bishop Reed now, um, all of the, uh, the bishops that have come forth from that uh, line of uh, apostolic mm. session from the apostles. And there's a way to trace it, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, I often share in our um, discovery day that um, my wife uh, is big in her family with martial arts. And I learned early on when we were married that when we go to gatherings, um, they would ask of others in these big martial arts gatherings, who's your teacher? Um, and, and it became evident to me very early on that if they didn't identify a teacher that was named by someone there that's, you know, in all their regalia with their black belt and all these things, it, it was cause for concern. Not mainly because, you know, there was a question of their legitimacy, but, you know, were they um, keeping people safe if they just opened up a shop somewhere and threw on a belt and, and, a, and a gi and started teaching, you know, uh, martial arts? I mean, could they hurt people? Um, did they really know what they were doing? Um, so kind of in the same way, um, tracking our lineage is a way to say that what we've been practicing, uh, I didn't just go kind of just buy this shirt and, and open up a strip center and say, hey, I'm a part of a, the historic Christian faith. But, you know, I've been formed in it. I've been trained in it. And I've been, uh, in a sense, licensed or, or ordained to minister within it. And so that's kind of what um, that really gets at is uh, it, it, it helps us with the unity of the body of Christ that we don't just further fracture, fracture into, uh, you know, 52 more flavors of Christianity, but hopefully mm -hmm. maintain what we're, what we've been passed down uh, to receive. So it's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Father, I can yes. say I totally understand that and appreciate it and have understood it and appreciated it for a very long time. And I appreciate it even more. My very best friend from all my years of teaching is Church of Christ. And I have attended services with them over the years, many times in different places. Sure. And it just makes me want to run with open arms right back to the Anglican or as I was Episcopalian at one point. Sure. And because of all of this, you know, it's, it's so important, I think, to know. It and does. It really there. makes a huge difference, you know, in uh, uniformity of practice, um, you know. So uh, it's a great comfort to me when folks ask me, could we do this in worship? Or can I tweak this in um, a burial rite? Or I'd like to do this with how we get married that I kind of say, I really don't have the authority to do that. I mean, I'm, um, I'm bound by what I've been <laughs> given. And sure, there are some elements that we can pepper with our own flavoring, but I don't have the authority to just ad hoc say, we're going to strike this, or we're going to add this in, or we're going to, you know, do this instead, or, you know, maybe instead of a reading of scripture, we'll just throw in a poem here. I mean, you know, these are not things that I have the ability to do. Um, and I've always found great comfort in that um, because far be it for me to be left to my own devices to try to figure out some way to do things better than really what's kind of been housed in what we've been given. So um, it's a beautiful thing uh, in many ways that we've been passed down and, uh, you know, kind of puts a lot of weight on us to make sure that we do so faithfully and hopefully in an attractive way that is winsome as well. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for us. Let's this in a little bit. So that fourth one, um, 
talks about the creeds. We'll look at those. Um, really, the Apostles' Creed, you'll run into most in morning and evening prayer. It's kind of the shortest. Um, while they're worded differently, the content is, is the same, and they were all kind of uh, bound by different context, excuse me, and eras in which they were written. Um, the Nicene Creed, the one we say every week, comes from uh, the Council of Nicaea, uh, the first ecumenical council gives us kind of the nutshell summary of the faith. Uh, I always tell our kids uh, in youth group when they say, my friends don't understand what it means to be uh, Angelican or Anglican or whatever you want to call it. Um, what do I say? And I always say, well, you can always say you believe in the creeds and you can point to that. Um, that sums up the faith better than any diatribe that you can come up with. Um, and it's been good enough for the church for millennia almost. I mean, it's, it's, you know, but dates back to, you know, 325. And so that last creed is the Athanasian creed, which is actually in this section. Um, the, uh, we actually say it, uh, a lot of traditions, uh, churches sometimes do. We do it once a year in all of its clunkiness, um, on Trinity Sunday, um, because it's attributed, um, to Athanasius. Uh, who wrote it at a time to kind of combat this idea that members of the Trinity were lesser than or subject to uh, one another. Um, so he goes through great painful detail to basically say that all three persons of the Trinity are equal and yet distinct. And then he goes with great repetition to explain that God the Father is not God the Son, but he is equal to God the Son. Um, and, you know, and he kind of explains this the way we, we've seen God the Son work in, in, in the world. And so he goes through that um, time and time again, and then ends with those kind of um, really stark words that this is the Catholic faith, uh, whereby if one does not hold to these things, cannot be saved. Basically, this is, this is the baseline standard. If you can't hold on to this, then we've got some big issues. So um, it's, it's a wonderful reminder. We do it on Trinity Sunday, uh, which kind of wraps up the church year uh, right after we celebrate Pentecost. Um, and we remember all three persons of the Trinity that we've seen um, and celebrated primarily in the life of, the G of Jesus, um, but also uh, in the Holy Spirit coming on Pentecost. Um, and certainly, of course, God the Father sending forth um, and, and working and birthing creation and speaking order into the world uh, as we see so many times in scripture. So um, all three of them get pulled in in worship in different <laughs> ways um, and at different times. That fifth one here um, confer, uh, concerns the seven councils of the undivided church. Again, um, there's a little bit of a quibbling point on some of the later councils. The first four councils dealt strictly with the Christological clarifications, namely, who is Jesus? Um, so right out of the pages of scripture, and even actually before scripture concludes, you remember in Jude and other places, you, you start to see uh, some of these rumblings about divisions that bubble up. It begins first over the circumcision party late in the pastoral epistles. Um, but then in the Catholic epistles uh, with Peter, uh, first and second Peter um, and John and elsewhere, you see these images pop up and uh, you see there's, there's trouble on the horizon. Um, and we see that shortly thereafter. Uh, one of the earliest heresies around Arianism challenges is Jesus um, truly divine or is he just a good guy? Um, and then after that, the, the coin flips to the other end. Well, maybe he was truly God. But if he's truly God, maybe he wasn't truly man because God can't suffer on the cross. That just doesn't make sense. Um, and then they work that out. And then they start thinking, well, did Jesus, if he's both fully God and fully man, did he really have his own will? Or is he just uh, preformed with all these decisions he's going to make? And they said, well, no, you can't split his will. You can kind of say, well, he's, he's fully man in that he was tempted in every way as we are, and yet fully God in that he can't did not sin. Um, so, you know, they, they nuance and figure all these things out. And then they try to figure out where's the Holy Spirit pop in. Is he equal then? Is he lesser to? Jesus says he's coming. Does that mean Jesus has control over him? You know, I mean, they go through all these things and they knock them out um, in these gatherings of the Christian church. 
And then they knock out some really fun and trivial stuff like, um, you know, should monks have tonsures? And if they should, what should it look like? And should they be covered in or outside of church? And um, just fun little, you know, family quabbles, you know, about differences on opinion on stuff. Um, but the latter councils dealt with things beyond just the nature and person of Jesus, um, where we find credence for iconography um, comes in the later councils. Um, some of the uh, grounds for invocation of the saints and some of those practices are found therein. So um, Anglicanism always kind of finding common ground has said, look, we can all agree on the basics. Um, some will kind of say, well, I'll hold to the latter ones insofar as they point to clarifying issues on Jesus. Um, those of us who kind of tend to be on the other end say, if it was good enough for the whole church back then, I don't know who I am to go and try to say it's better for me to revise those later. Um, so you, you get a little variance of opinion on these things as you kind of go forward um, and work them out. Uh, but uh, that's what that one is about. Any questions on any of those thus far? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll keep on moving. The next one is a big one, um, namely in the 39 articles. Um, the 39 articles, in many ways, are um, vindicated by their place in history. Um, so by that, I mean, um, as we say from the get-go, uh, we take them in their literal and grammatical sense. Uh, but we also know that they're written in a very heated time and age, and some things therein um, aren't as hot-button issues anymore. So, for instance, uh, let's see if I can be adept enough to pop this up. Some of these are uh, just timeless things, um, like Article 5 on who the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit is. Uh, let me see... I probably won't be able to find it quickly. The 39 articles were written by Cranmer, right? That's exactly right. And uh, I had some input with others. Um, oh, wait. Is that it? No. One of them. Ah, this is always a fun one. So that line right there, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was never intended to be reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. Um, came at a time when uh, the lay people, for instance, um, at the time of the Reformation were actually not allowed to receive communion. Um, they would receive by just viewing. So kind of like what happens now, but um, not out of choice, but out of mandate. Um, so you got some very weird practices. Uh, there's kind of an old joke about Irish dads who would take their families to church, drop them off, um, would stand outside, smoke, talk, hang out with other, other dads. When the bells would ring, they'd pop their head in the church, they'd cross themselves at the elevation, and they'd step back out and they'd wait for the next set of bells to ring. They'd do the same thing again, and then they'd carry on until their families came out. Not catechized, not really engaged at all, but they had made their obligation, and that was that. Um, so, it was written at a time trying to deal with that abuse. Nowadays, um, for instance, you know, the fact that we elevate at the, you know, prayer of consecration isn't somehow against that, um, but rather uh, the faithful have a chance to receive um, toward that end, week in and week out. So certain things within this have to be read in the time in which they're written, um, which of course were in the heat and the, uh, the thick of uh, the Reformation and the, some of the abuses that were found therein. Um, so that's um, kind of what I mean by way of example um, of just one uh, thing therein. Now, oh, I love frogged. 
leftover one. Um, the sixth point um, deals with the preface and, well, not the preface, sorry, that's a bit later, but um, the Book of Common Prayer. The 1662, while not the first, kind of became the one in which every other prayer book began to springboard off of as we kind of settled in. Um, <clears throat> and as such, um, it kind of becomes the standard for Anglican tradition and worship, as that says. The reason for that, um, as I'm sure you know, is that um, just kind of as we've talked about, um, since uh, really uh, the prayers and the practice of Anglicanism uh, is formed by the prayer book and the services therein, um, really the theology um, and, and all that we hold is kind of uh, housed in practice in the Book of Common Prayer. And so as such, um, that becomes kind of the foundational document upon which many of these things are, are, are built on top of. And so um, that one is kind of housed as the, the gold standard, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, from which many of the others uh, find their origin. And so um, the Anglican Church in North America, of which we are a part, um, kind of houses all that together um, that maintains the faith uh, of the church as we have received it. So um, I love that because in many ways, I don't know of any other prayer book of recent history that has kind of housed its, um, its business, its belief right up front in that section. Usually it's just kind of interspersed with all these things and you kind of pull them in and uh, try to make sense of them all. So it's, it's very well done and worded as such. But any questions about any of that before we kind of take a look, a quick look at some of the other sections in here? It's a pretty historical context. When did Luther, what year did Luther post his 49 articles? His theses. His 95 yeah. theses. Yeah. Huh? His theses. His theses on the door, um, right in line with this. Um, I have never been quick to recall the exact dates um, to certain time periods. I'm sure a quick search would bear it out, but they're all contemporaries. Cramner uh, and Luther um, and, and, and a little bit of overlap even with Calvin as well. So they're all kind of right in that same time period uh, on different okay. continents. So of course, Luther being in Germany, Cramner being in England. Um, right. Calvin and, and Zwingli being in, in kind of Switzerland and that, that region of Europe. Um, so none of these things are going on in a vacuum by any stretch. Um, right. A lot of them have a little bit of cross-pollinization um, and a little bit of cross, uh, you know, communication as these things play mm -hmm. out. So this next section is actually a rather interesting one. Um, so the filioque clause is one passing line that has caused much angst since 1100 AD. Um, it comes in the creed. Uh, and if you were to look at the creed, I think with a little bit of work here on page 109, let me give you an example of this. So, oops. Filioque clause, oh, went too far. Is and the sun. Let's see, here it is. Okay, so in the creed, you'll actually see it blocked out if you're in a prayer book. It's not in our bulletins, but um, right here, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the words and the son. Um, that means, you know, filioque, filie, um, and, and then refers to the son. Theologically, there's no problem with this. Um, but when the creed was bound together, those words were not in it and the son. Um, it's assumed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son. It's inferred, um, who with father and the son is worshiped and glorified. The reason it's caused much angst is that um, the, the Roman Catholic Church and the Council of Toledo put that in there to deal with um, a heresy, again, that had popped back up about Jesus' divinity. Um, so they were kind of playing whack-a-mole. They added that back in, but they did not consult 
anyone else. They did not consult um, the, uh, the Orthodox Church or any other churches at large at the time. So while it's theologically absolutely poignant and correct, um, they didn't actually consult anyone in a council. They just added it in. Um, and it caused great consternation ever since because it kind of lended to this idea that Rome sees itself as the Catholic Church, which basically means that they're the universal church, which then implies that no one else is. <laughs> and so as such, um, it's always caused some, some frustration on, on broader uh, uh, communications and, and dialogues. Um, and so when this prayer book was put together, um, due to a lot of the uh, work and uh, consultations with and meetings with our Orthodox brethren, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians, um, out of sensitivity to them and their uh, kind of challenge with this. Um, it's the only prayer book that's actually added that in as optional. Um, we've, we say it every Sunday, but some churches actually choose not to um, and have uh, just left it out. Um, most of us are formed with saying it, know it by heart, um, so it's a little clunky, uh, but that's what this resolution is all about. Um, it's kind of dating back to that in its original context back in 325, and then in 381 in another council uh, at Constantinople. Um, so um, because of that, they kind of add that in as an option in local worship. One little fact. And then here's the Athanasian Creed that we talked a little bit about. It kind of begins and ends with those, those really bold words. Um, basically everything here that you'll find in here is what Christians should hold to and believe. And so you'll notice, of course, um, he goes through um, with great repetition. Um, you know, the Father's uncreated, the Son's uncreated, the Holy Ghost is uncreated, the Father's incomprehensible, the Son's incomprehensible, the Holy Ghost is incomprehensible. So he, he's drawing with every um, single bit that, that they're co-eternal um, and equal, um, but distinct um, in persons of the Godhead. So then he kind of goes through, it's almost three pages in here, um, where he unpacks that um, with great uh, depth and detail, and then kind of ends as he began um, with these words. This is essentially what one would hold to, uh, to believe as the church has always put it forth, the universal church, uh, faithfully as such. And so that's what that, uh, that document is all about, or creed, I should say, is all about. Any questions on any of that? Well, the 39 Articles of Religion are really theological, as we've kind of looked at in premise, um, and unpack um, belief. And it's really kind of an, an, uh, a working out in our tradition of that. Um, it's a great, uh, really, you could spend a year just looking at these, but um, uh, it, it deals with all sorts of things that arise in Scripture. Um, questions that uh, many have had and relationship to them. So what are the canonical books? What do you do with um, the Apocrypha? Um, these others, um, what, what, what is our position in relation to those? All those kinds of things are worked out in the 39 articles. So I'd certainly commend them uh, to your reading and, and certainly any questions that may arise. The next document in this lineup, um, scroll down here a little bit further, is, it ends with the amendments in the 1800s uh, to those 39 articles, and then we get to the Jerusalem Declaration, which is Basically, what we we're talking about is hammered out in 2008. Um, and in many ways, is kind of our 
reformational 39 articles of contemporary era uh, in many ways. Um, reaffirms uh, things like the 39 articles, the ecumenical councils, um, and, and so many other things that have somewhat been challenged in recent generations. Um, and so it pulls those forward to kind of say, we affirm these. And uh, now actually to be a province that ascribes to GAFCON or wants to be a part of GAFCON, they have to sign off on this and say, we, act, we will adhere to and we believe these things. Um, and again, none of them really should be a shock uh, to anyone in Anglicanism. Um, however, um, some of these things have been challenged as of late and as such, um, they have become issues uh, that need further clarification. And so uh, they've kind of housed all these things together. Um, that mission uh, continues to be to reach and baptize people. The saving uh, news of Jesus Christ is not to just deal with temporal needs. There's, there's an agenda there. Our agenda is always to bring Christ into those situations. Um, how we handle marriage between one man and one woman. Um, how we're committed uh, to these ecumenical relationships. We don't want to just do Christianity in our tribe in a bubble and say, you know, our flavor is either the best or we're not concerned with others, but we should take great pains um, to try to live out Jesus' high priestly prayer in, you know, in John 17, that we might all be one. And what can we do in so far as it depends on us uh, to continue those dialogues and to maintain them in prayer? So a lot of these things um, are kind of played out uh, they're in um, and, you know, recognizing wonderfully that we're going to have differences. And so we should just deal with those charitably uh, and work together on the issues that divide us. And so um, there's some great things that came right out of that era uh, back in 2008 that um, really are still relevant uh, and probably will be for generations. So this may be one of those documents that's in the textbooks uh, if Jesus doesn't return uh, sooner, um, that people look back on similarly, perhaps, to the 39 articles. So, um, so that's what that's about. Any questions on any of those mm -hmm. or on that document as a whole? I can tell you that that's much easier to read than the 39 articles. <laughs> So but if ever there was a language. document that needed to be just written in plain English, that'd be it. Yeah. There's been some attempts, but, you know, like all things, every time it's attempted to be updated, um, some of the original gets lost. So in some ways, they just always pull it forward in all its clunkiness. But it, it, it certainly, you, you got to have your wits about you to wade into that one for sure. Mm. <clears throat> And then the last two documents wonderfully pull forward the preface of uh, the earlier prayer books. 1549 is our first prayer book. Um, and this, this is kind of explaining the reason for uh, the prayer book. Why does it exist? Um, what does it order? Um, lays out things in the church year. Um, lays out uh, challenges and kind of rules or rhythms that are set forth. Uh, so it's, uh, it's wonderfully commended and pulled forward, kind of it's an original form, which not unlike you said, Donna, is a little clunky in its language uh, because, you know, really they were pioneering the English language at that time from bringing it in from Latin. So it, it, this is actually a very cleaned up version, but due to the joys of technology, you can go find it in its original, sometimes photocopied format and things look misspelled and things look odd because truly, I mean, they were, they were bringing in these words sometimes without bringing a lot of, um, you know, meaning with them uh, initially. So they'd teach on it later, but, you know, vouchsafe us, vouchsafe to feed us or um, God's inestimable love. Um, you know, I mean, these kind of $10 words that just are really kind of coined uh, in many ways, almost poetically. Uh, by uh, by Cramner and then John Dunn and so many others who kind of put them to meter and rhythm. Um, so these prefaces are really treasures kind of of our of our tradition. And then the 1662 um, pulls that forward and a little bit um, more in the context of the age in which it's written and the Reformation itself. So um, those are kind of the two last documents I believe um, that round out. Yep, that round out that whole section. 
And so they're, they're kind of wonderful to explore. There's not a whole lot else uh, that they've shoved into this section. So everything really has meaning and purpose. Um, it's not just kind of a catch all for everything else in the you know, appendix that we didn't know what to do with. Um, but each is there for a purpose and a reason. So it's, it's a great section that has a lot of diversity in it. But um, there you have it. Any questions, though? Not for me. We had to leave because she can't sit still. Her body. Yeah, that's all right. Everybody else kicks totally in. All right. And she uh, has to. <laughs>